All right, everybody. So we're going to be picking up where we left off last time, talking about how the <clears throat> we talked about how the elites were really doing everything in their power and going to great lengths to be able to pass laws in order to split up the lower classes. So the slaves, the Native Americans, the poor indentured white servants. So they really were focused on splitting up the people. And all of this tension and anger is going to come to a head with what we're about to talk about, Bacon's Rebellion. And no, I'm not talking about the good Bacon. I'm talking about Nathaniel Bacon. So anyway, looking at our notes, you'll see your notes are kind of in a separate format or a different format this time than usually, but it should be pretty straightforward. So we're going to talk about the three groups that were involved in Bacon's Rebellion, and we're going to be able to note which groups started the uprising and then which two groups they ended up fighting. So the first group we're going to talk about is the poor colonists, the lower class colonists. So these are going to be the people that are on the frontier and the lower class. So they're the ones who actually started this uprising. So that's your first group. Your second group is the Native Americans. And your third group is the colonial elite. So those two last groups that I mentioned, the Native Americans and the elite, those are the two groups that the poor fought against. So we've got our setup. We've got the poor colonists led by Nathaniel Bacon. And then on the other side, we've got the Native Americans and the colonial elite. And so there were two lower class groups that ended up uniting for, to join together to fight in Bacon's Rebellion. And so they're going to be angry. That's why they're going to join together. So the first group you need to know is this white frontiersmen. These are poor white frontiersmen. So these are essentially farmers that lived on the very edge of the society of the colonies. So they lived right there on the frontier near the quote, quote, wilderness. And so they ended up living really near Native Americans. So that's that first group. They're angry over how the elites were running the colonies. So they're really angry over how the elites were running the colonies and setting up the tax system and they were being used. So they were angry. That's your first group. Your second group are the indentured servants and slaves. So the indentured servants and slaves are angry over the obvious, the fact that they are essentially enslaved. And they're also angry over the fact that there's a huge gap between the rich and the poor. And they fall on the very poor. So they are being used. They're the ones who are paying the taxes and they're angry. So they're ready to rebel. So we get to it, the where and the why. So this rebellion started in Virginia. So the rebellion started, Bacon's Rebellion started in Virginia. And so why exactly did it take place? So there's kind of a four part thing to this. So why did Bacon's Rebellion happen? So it happened mainly because the elites own the majority of the land in Virginia and the settlers were being pushed further and further towards the frontier. So the settlers, who were the lower class whites, they were tired of being pushed further and further towards the Native Americans. They were getting the worst land, in their opinion, and the elites had the best land in Virginia. And so this made them angry, the lower class white people, because they were having to deal with the natives on the frontier. They were having to fight the natives on the frontier. You know, they couldn't understand why the natives would be mad uh, that they're moving on to this land, you know, not that it's the native's land or anything like that, but you know. So these lower class frontiersmen, they ask for help from the colonial government, so the elites, but the elites refused to fight the natives. They refused. And so the poor who were the frontiersmen who were struggling to survive without any help from the government, so Bacon was able to capitalize on this and he helped them lead this rebellion of the people. So not only were the frontiersmen mad, but the lower class people uh, living throughout the colony were mad as well because none of them were be having their voices heard. And they were the ones being taken advantage of. So Bacon, Nathaniel Bacon was able to unite them together. And so you know, Bacon draws up this big document he draws up this big document to explain his issues, his grievances against the colonial elite. And he calls it the Declaration of the People. Kind of sounds similar to the Declaration of Independence. We'll actually compare those at a later lesson. 
but this declaration of the people, and it blended the frontiersmen's hatred of the natives with the common people's hatred of the elites. So the two groups that we were talking about that made up this rebellion, it was the declaration of the people, it blended the frontiersmen's, their hatred of the natives with the common people's hatred of the elites. And it blended them together into this document that was able to unite everyone. And so there was this guy that um, his, we're going into the Declaration of the People. Then it talks about the groups of people um, that Bacon and his followers are angry with. They're angry at the elites, like I mentioned, and they're angry at the Native Americans. And so this guy named Thomas Grantham, Mm. Okay, so this guy named Thomas Grantham, who was he? Thomas Grantham. So what exactly did he do? He was the captain of the colonial militia. So the elites sent out the militia, this army, to put down Bacon's Rebellion. And he, so he, Grantham is famous because he ended up tricking the rebels into surrendering. So Bacon ended up dying of a... Uh, it was like malaria, so to speak. And so the rebellion started to fall apart. So the last remaining rebels, Grantham was able to trick them into surrendering with the promise of pardoning them of their crime. So he was gonna essentially be like, you know what, we'll let you go. But he ended up lying about it and instead caused 23 rebels to be killed and the rebellion was brought to a very violent and bloody end. That wasn't necessary, but they wanted to make a statement. They wanted to make an example out of these people and say, like, this is what happens when you fight back. So kind of to dissuade them from wanting to fight. So this chain of oppression in Virginia. Okay, so we get to this chain of oppression in Virginia. And this is one of the reasons why Bacon ended up losing overall. So this chain of oppression so each link in this chain, each step in this chain is a different group of people that become oppressed by the elites. So step one of this chain of oppression is the natives had their land seized by the white frontiersmen. So the natives became oppressed by the white frontiersmen. But then the frontiersmen in step two were taxed and controlled by the rich elites in Virginia. So the frontiersmen then became uh, oppressed by the elites in, in Virginia. You get to step three, and this is where the entire colony, both rich and poor, were being used by England to make huge profits. So the entire colony is then oppressed by the rich, both rich and poor, were oppressed by the king of England because they were being used to make profits for the king. So we see at each step, there's a new larger group that ends up becoming oppressed. So step one, we mentioned the natives, step two, the frontiersmen, and then step three, the entire colony. So at each chain or each link of the chain, a new group became oppressed by someone higher up than them. Okay, so what was life like for people in the colonies who did not have a lot of money. So talking about the life of the people that did not have a lot of money. So life was just as bad, if not worse, than life back in Europe. So life for the colonists, the poor colonists, were just as bad, if not worse, than the people in Europe. And they ended up coming to the colonies with this hope of a new life, only to then become indentured servants. And they had no power and no way to better themselves. So at each step, they were just becoming more and more um, worse off than they were back in Europe. And they realized quickly, like, wow, I'm just as bad off here that I was in Europe. And now they're indentured servants. So it's almost even worse in many ways. But there were three main fears that the elites had in the British colonies. So the, there were three huge fears that the elites had uh, in North America. One dealt with the Native American hostility, so they were worried about the Native Americans attacking back at them and taking them over. 
They were always worried about possible slave revolts as well. That's the second one. So they were worried about possible slave revolts. And then the third is this gro growing class of angry, poor white people. So they're seeing that they have three, a three front attack that could come at them at any time and they're worried. And so they see and their biggest fear is all three of them coming together. So they've got to figure out how to put this down, how to solve these issues. And so when Bacon's rebellion breaks out, that's kind of like the sum of all their fears because they see all these people getting together against them. So we're talking about is Bacon's rebellion really a rebellion against capitalism or is it a rebellion against the people? And so it really was over the tremendous gap in wealth between the rich and the poor. So Bacon's rebellion overall was really about this gap, this wealth gap. But then at the same time, it was also over the Native Americans and his issues with the Native Americans. So Bacon overall was more mad about the fact that the Native Americans were, in his view, a threat and the elites wouldn't do anything about it. And then other people were, saw it as a rebellion against the elites overall, which when it comes down to it, it's over this tremendous amount of power that the elites had over everybody. And it just took many different forms. And so how did the colonists prevent further unification of the enslaved Africans, indigenous Americans, and the poor whites? And, so, and then what role of race did this play? So Bacon's rebellion, it was highlighted as the greatest fear of the elites, which was the rebellion of slaves and poor whites. So this was this big, huge fear that they had. And so the elites had to come up with a tool to prevent this from happening again. And they came, and it, this is what materialized into racism. Because racism was not some natural feeling to have about the differences between a black person and a white person. This anger and this feeling of superiority was not a natural thing. It had to be man-made. And so the white elites began to encourage a negative view of the slaves in order to turn poor whites and slaves against each other. And so these whites encouraged a negative view of the slaves. And so if they were able to make poor white people view slaves as inferior or less than them, then they could be prevented from uniting. And that's something that we're gonna notice is gonna be a common theme throughout the remainder of the school year and it's still relevant today. The poor white people, the elites got the poor white people to view slaves as being less than them or inferior and this, in turn, caused them to fight against one another and not unite. And so finally, we get to the very end of how does the prevention of a unified enslaved Africans and the indigenous and the poor whites serve as a protection for capitalism? So how did this separation protect capitalism? So in doing so, it created a formation of what was known as the middle class that we know of today. And that middle class served as a buffer against the natives, the slaves, and the poor whites. So it served as like a middleman, middle class, between the elites and the lower class. And so by having the middle class join with the elites, they could prevent any uprising of the lower class people and protect the status quo. So the elites saw this creation of the middle class as a way to keep not only their power, but to prevent any others from challenging their power. And so this allowed the elites to continue to gain more and more wealth. So we saw this allow them to gain more and more wealth. And so this is where we're gonna leave off uh, for this section of the notes in our lecture. And the next time that we meet in person, we're going to discuss not only Bacon's Rebellion uh, in further detail, but we're gonna work together uh, to complete these because but so statements discussing Bacon's rebellion and how it ended up leading. It could have really upended the system overall. So make sure to pause, rewind, go back, listen to this as many times as you need. And if you have any questions at all, we will uh, discuss them in class. All right, thank you.